Can we get uh, one or two note takers? Anybody want to volunteer? I see one. Can we get one more note taker? Okay, one, one. Okay, Roman note taker, Danny note taker, Chris Jabber scribe. Who else? Are you really going to sit all the way over there, Peter? <laughs> yes, you are. All right, is it on or off? Are we on? Oh, we're on. <coughs> Good morning. Welcome to the SACOM Working Group. Uh, if you're sitting behind the pillar, we can't see you. So uh, if you're <laughs> over there, I, oh, I see a hand. Somebody waved. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, welcome to the SACOM Working Group. Uh, yes, this is the revised NetWell everybody has seen previously, right? Excellent. Uh, there is, we have Jabberscribe, Jabber Chris. Chris, and we have takers, Danny and Roman, Roman note-takers. Excellent. All right. Uh, <laughs> So this is the rest of the agenda, agenda bashing. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Dave Waltermeyer, um, is there a way to re reorder the, the agenda slightly? Um, I have to leave for the last half hour um, um, to attend another another meeting. Um, would it be possible to do the charter discussion er earlier in the in the agenda? And as I would like to leave with Dave um, and maybe push five to the end because I know this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
Any other agenda bashing requests? All right, so I, I would personally like to do, to get through the hackathon stuff first. So, uh, hackathon. You what? <laughs> He's just very proud of himself. <laughs> no, no, actually, we, we use the slides from, from there. Oh, that we didn't know. Yeah, right. Slides. So, now, this. Okay. <laughs> so, so, what we'll do is we'll, we'll discuss, uh, we'll do items two and three, the hackathon stuff first, or, yeah, first, uh, then we'll do the charter, uh, and then we'll move through the existing work items. Um, <coughs> do we... Eight becomes four. Well, then the question is whether we move five down, but maybe not. Maybe. Said it's, okay. It's, it's okay with Charles? So we're doing one, two, three, eight, four, six, seven, five. In all my years of chairing, I don't think I've ever bashed an agenda quite this much. <laughs> so, <You're welcome>. <laughs> bashing. <laughs> All right, <laughs> and, and a reminder to anybody on the other side of the pillar that's sitting down, we can't see you, and uh, so I guess if you want to remain incognito, that's a good place to sit. Uh, so moving on, hackathon results. So he's going to... Oh, on... oh, okay. Yeah, that means I have to find it quickly. Let's see. If I uh, I know where it is. I just it'll be faster for you. Yeah, it's. I've, uh, I just don't. What? I just um. I didn't want everybody to observe my process for actually finding this document. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Oops. Oh, no, no, no. No, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> no. That was I hit the wrong back button. Second. Sweet. Perfect. There isn't a, there isn't any slides. I'm I'm just going to talk around this diagram, um, and I'll keep my comments brief. So, um, um, good morning. Um, uh, my name is is Dave Waltermeyer, um, and um, what I'm going to give is a quick update on uh, the SACM hackathon activity uh, that we had earlier this, this week, um, where we um, built a, a proof of concept of, of uh, an implementation of the, the vulnerability assessment scenario. So our goal was to uh, to um, work under the assumption that uh, a vendor will release a, a security bulletin identifying a vulnerability in a product and that an end user organization who is a customer of that vendor would need to um, to be able to analyze the software inventory of their devices and then determine uh, which of those devices um, would contain uh, that software vulnerability. So uh, we designed over, over uh, the course of our planning activities for the hackathon, uh, we um, designed um, this this implementation architecture, um, which incorporates a number of existing um, um, standardization efforts um, here at the IETF. Some some within uh, SACM and others within Mile um, as well. So um, quickly talking through the diagram, which. Is no longer on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so what we ended up doing was we ended up um, 
co cobbling together a solution that, that was comprised of a number of open source projects as well as um, some, some commercial um, products. So if, if you look at um, the right-hand side of this diagram, uh, we have the, um, the target endpoint. So this is the, the endpoint where the vulnerable, the potentially vulnerable software may be installed. Um, the, the, the gray box uh, just to the left of that represents um, the um, collector. In, in this case, which is um, which is orchestrating a collection of uh, the software load um, on the device uh, using uh, Swimma, one of the drafts that uh, we'll be talking about later in in the agenda. Swimma allows um, two modes of of collection. The first is um, it allows the the collector to you know to to ask for um, the current software load of the device. And Swim also allows for um, the collector to subscribe to change events relating to the software. So in this case, we, we implemented the first use case, which is being able to pull the client on, on, on the, the, the target endpoint to, to get the software load. Um, so StrongSwan does that polling. It, uh, it, it communicates with the PT. TLS client on the device. Um, it um, looks at the package database um, on a, a, an Ubuntu system. It um, generates SWID tags out of the package database. Swim is used to transport those SWID tags to the server, and then those tags are made available um, to downstream consumers. So to round out the assessment solution, we built uh, we enhanced uh, the um, C the CIS syscat tool uh, to be able to um, to query the the SWID tags that were stored on the strong TNC server. Um, we used Oval uh, to um, to evaluate those SWID tags to look for um, uh, SWID tags on on the strong TNC server that match uh, a specific you know, vulnerable software version. And then uh, we use that to report whether the device was vulnerable. Um, the oval definitions, uh, as well as other vulnerability management information, was retrieved from the Roly server, which is the leftmost box, uh, which is based on a specification from Mile. And the Roly server allowed us to dynamically serve up uh, the oval content uh, to the um, assessment server. So we were able to, to get this architecture uh, working. Uh, we, um, we were able to do a complete run through of the vulnerability assessment scenario, and we were able to identify a, a vulnerable uh, system using this method. In doing so, we've learned um, a few different lessons out of, out of this project. So. Um, the first thing that we learned was that um, turning the vulnerability, what we're calling vulnerability detection data, or VDD, um, you know, a vulnerability bulletin, um, into an oval definition is actually a rather uh, difficult task. Um, it took us a number of hours during the hackathon to write a single oval definition that could you know, look for that vulnerability. Um, so the other the other challenge we had was um, it was it was kind of difficult to to actually query for the the software um, that was of interest uh, to us um, with with the strong TNC server. Now we weren't using any kind of standardized um, API. Uh, we were using you know an existing capability that had existed with strong TNC. Um, um, so we feel like. There's probably some some work that's needed in order to um, you know to enhance the usability of of that that kind of kind of service. Um, so so one of the lessons learned we had was that we need some kind of API that will allow for you know for queries to be um, performed against the data store. Um, and I think as a working group we might want to consider looking at um, what other existing work. 
um, in the IATF or elsewhere that might be applicable in, in that case. Um, we also need to, you know, back to the oval point, we also need to find a way to better ask uh, questions of an enterprise data store uh, containing posture information such as as SWID tags. Um, you know, the, the oval querying capability that we were using, you know, was cumbersome. Um, there's there's got to be a better way uh, to do that. Um, we've actually proposed a, a work item um, to be added to the charter uh, to work on a new evaluation approach uh, to to try to you know work out uh, some of those those issues. Um, uh, and then the other thing is something that Swima doesn't do today is. SWID tags contain file hash information, so you can you can use that hash information to determine if a given corresponding file on the device um, has been modified. Um, really, to determine whether a vulnerability is present or whether the integrity of software on a device um, has been changed or not, you need to be able to use that you know, golden measurement in that hash to be able to, to check to see if the, the file has been tampered with. Um, we really have no mechanism um, in the current set of SACM specifications to be able to, um, to collect file information uh, to be able to do that, that level of assessment, um, which also means we can't verify that once the software is patched, that the patched files are actually installed. So that's another gap that we should you know, consider closing. Um, and then lastly, uh, most of the orchestration activities that we did um, as part of this, uh, this demonstration, the collecting of content from the Rolly server, the gathering of software inventory from, from the, the, the collecting of the software inventory from the device, this was all kind of manually orchestrated uh, within within the solution, um, and so having having a more standardized method of being able to support orchestration uh, uh, would also be be helpful because it would allow us to more dynamically orchestrate um, these kinds of workflows. Roman Danilo, CMU. Uh, Dave, if you could just clarify the third lesson learned. You were saying that you know SWIDs have have file hash information, and you can use that to look at endpoints, to look at whether things were modified. And then you were saying things about, well, we still have difficulty seeing whether patches were applied. Can you talk a little well, so bit about that? Well, so the only thing that? we can basically go by is whether um, whether the, the device sort of coarsely says, yes, I have this, this software installed. Um, the next step of verification would be to actually look on the device to see if the software is, is installed. So to be able to examine the file system to, you know, to verify that the software is actually there and that it's the, you know, the version of the software that you're looking for. So I think what we were talking about is you know, this, this demonstrates the ability to take package database information and use that as part of the software inventory. Um, but if there's any delta between what's what's um, included in the package database versus what's actually on the file system, um, we have really no way of, of, of verifying that. And that was one of the things that we talked about as part of the hackathon. Thanks for that clarity. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, hello, uh, Frank Xia Huawei. Uh, uh, firstly, I, I'd like to say that I, I, I like this uh, whole demo because it is a, I, uh, it is an ambitious demo because it covers a lot of working group work, Mile and SACOM, and I think uh, there are some from uh, NetConf because we need to collect uh, the information from network. So it is a very good test uh, uh, trying uh, to do end-to-end uh, -end, uh, um, uh, network security information monitoring. And uh, uh, my, my, uh, I, I'm interested about uh, the lesson you learned in this uh, in this end-to-end uh, um, -end architecture, because you cover uh, different work from different working group. Um, so, um, so, so, do you feel that currently uh, the work in this working group, uh, uh, in your in your demo, you you find that they are very clear, differentiated, and they can 
work work together very well, and uh, is there some overlapping or some 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 conflicts among them? Something do you have this lesson? Can you kind of this lesson? Um. Well. <laughs> I would actually say that we're probably we have more gaps than we actually have overlap um, in 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 this in this solution architecture. Um, Hank may have a different view, um, but he's going to give an update on the other hackathon activity um, okay. that that he was involved in. Um, I mean, we we had to use a lot of proprietary interfaces and protocols um, as part of this solution. So I think what we found was that there's a lot more standardization work. You know that could be done in this space. Um, the collector that we used was, you know, kind of built to deal with um, more classical kinds of endpoint devices, you know, like servers and laptops and and uh, and desktops and that sort of thing. Um, one of the things that we are interested in doing is incorporating, you know, more of the Netconf and 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 Yang activity into into this architecture as a way of maybe doing a similar kind of assessment scenario with with uh, network devices, you know, like routers, switches, firewalls. Um, so I think there's there's lots of room for more integration of of existing solutions into into this architecture. Um, so I find more gaps than I do, you know, than I do overlap. Um, we didn't have a lot of different choices as far as you know the other standards that we were using, um, so yeah, I, I can't really think of any any overlap yeah. that we ran into. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I, I understand. Yeah, it's it's a first time test, so a lot of experience is is learning. Okay. Shweta, Cisco. Thank you for doing this. This is really interesting work. Um, I think you touched about what I was going to ask. Uh, if you replace the endpoint with a router or a switch, um, doing replacing Swima with uh, with uh, netconf, resconf to pull the similar data, and and even the file hashes you are mentioning, the IMA stuff, that will also be very interesting to do. If um, and I, I think that's that's important to get it done as well. That's great. Um, yeah, so we've been talking as a group, and we would like to do that as part of the the next hackathon. Um, we would like to combine some of the work that's been done across the two hackathon projects. Uh, and, and that's one of the dimensions that we'd like to incorporate. And I would invite you to come help us. Yes, um, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Hank, and uh, this is now my TCG header on. Uh, there's a lot of IMA related work being conducted in the Trusted Computer Group right at this moment. So if we want to delve into the IMA solution space, we most certainly should approach people in charge over there because they are really far ahead with that. They are already talking about how do you deal with hibernation and IMA and stuff. So uh, they have problems we haven't even seen yet. Right. <laughs> uh, just, just adding to that, uh, but building visibility into IMA uh, using the the network management protocols like NetConf, ResConf, to s get visibility of what what was measured on the box is important. I think that should happen here. Um, creating telemetry about IMA measured boot, secure boot stuff uh, would create an insane amount of data. It is not even comparable. To what we do at the moment, it is not even even software inventory is is tiny we, in we comparison should, to IMA. Yeah, we should move on. Yeah, sure. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. Oh, yes. Does he have slides? They were just uploaded. Oh, perfect. I'm not sure if it's on that Hi, I'm Hank from the Fraunhofer Institute of Secure Information Technology. I sent the same slides, uh, you can call them slides, basically a diagram again. And it is also not readable. <laughs> it, is, it is the initial plan we distributed amongst uh, engineers to create. Uh, it's in your mailbox, Adam. 
Oh, and you have both. Just, just talk. Okay, talk. talk um, so we took the I'm downloading. liberty. <laughs> we took the liberty to start with um, Yang-based collection, which seemed rather unfeasible three years ago for this work group, but but it was okay because it was always about queries, querying a API for data at rest, and current work basically led by uh, Eric White and uh, Alexander Clem, which is the Yang push and the Yang subscribe notification work in NetConf. We are now able to subscribe to a Yang module using uh, subtrees or XPath expressions. And we can do periodic, like for example, one a minute, solicited pushes or unchanged pushes. Um, this here, what you can read is that we have two locations in the hackathon. We had these are live machines running in the USA and the People's Republic of China. We connected to the dev labs and had the second components. I will walk through the slides. I will leave the box, sorry. Okay. So these are here components, second collectors, and this is the broker. So we created second components actually, as described with the current terminology. We have included function into those, the standard function for Yang push notifications is written in Python. And the uh, available open source XMPP grid client is written in Java. So we, of course, faced as with every hackathon ever, uh, interoperability within our components, and used in this example only the Kafka bus as a no local cluster running on the um, running on the component. It is just a hackathon solution. It was a hack, literally. So uh, every topic uh, that had to be uh, filled to be uh, a um, we brokered content in the second domain via XMPP grid, had an appropriate um, corresponding uh, uh, partition in the Kafka bus. So we didn't have to take care of uh, integrating Python, Java, Ruby, and uh, C code, actually. Um, yeah, the result is that uh, we uh, basically uh, um, could uh, address a lot of the general um, requirements of the uh, <laughs> Uh, second requirements document. Could you just skip to the next slide, please? There's a second slide. So we addressed, this is an excerpt only, um, requirements that were not really discussed before. Data partitioning, of course, important because uh, data is coming from two different parts of the world and it is maybe confidential to both. So we retained uh, partitioning until the broker allowed a subscriber to see both. So there's content authorization in place. We of course used now finally push mechanisms that can be used with literally every Yang module. I was having a small uh, open hour discussion with Benoit Claire about this and Warren was also there and uh, he was uh, pretty much very happy that we used state-of-the-art uh, NC client library uh, software to you it's basically about um, push 04 uh, implementation is a little bit behind in draft text that is at 07 at the moment I think um, but still uh, we could do periodic and on change um, subscriptions with XPath and subtrees and it all worked excellent we got netconf notifications and wrapped them into a experimental data second model which we also uh, composed in uh, XMB, XML, XSD, because NetConf is also XML, XSD was the easiest way to do it. Uh, I pushed a uh, sub individual draft uh, to the list. It's, it's an FYI on the second list that explains how we did the, uh, use the uh, second information model to uh, broker the output of that Yang push stuff. Yeah. Um, G13 is on this list because uh, uh, luckily neighborhood uh, link layer link layer neighborhood discovery was one of the modules we could use as on change. So we can now, if we discover, we can now do auto discovery due to that because one 
network equipment can maybe see its neighbors. And then we now have a target endpoint discovery. And then we can crawl through the topology and find each other piece of network equipment to then assess. So this is actually a, an implicit discovery mechanism of target endpoints. And that's why I listed G13 here. I wanted to highlight that explicitly. Uh, Danny was so kind to uh, add uh, information elements for that uh, a few months ago. Thank you very much. We made use of those. <laughs> so this is my short report on what we did and why we did it, because Yang modules are actually now in production. We used products that are being sold on the market today on both sides of Huawei and Cisco. Uh, Stephen Banghart NIST. I worked on the other hackathon project. Just wanted to say really quick that it was really cool to see the applicability of Yang and Yang related standards here in kind of the SACM space and that this was uh, really good work. I'm glad it got done. Uh, first of all, thank you. <laughs> and then uh, my uh, quick discussion with Benoit today uh, involved, and this was planned with Dave. Um, the uh, soft, uh, Yang module about um, software inventory. And um, we discussed semantic overlap or the complement, uh, semantic discrepancy between same name or type of uh, leaf nodes in Yang. And uh, Benoit asked me, how would you solve it? And he, after I explained it to him, it's a bit complicated, we can do this offline. His literal words were like, uh, yeah, I would do the exactly same thing. So um, he, but they were planning for this problem. They have no use case for that explicitly selected yet. And they see software inventory as a use case to, the, to solve discrepancies and overlap uh, uh, vice versa uh, with different Yang modules, which is a problem if you have 2,000 Yang modules, there will be some redundancy there. And mapping this redundancy is an interesting challenge by itself. And they want to use metadata augments for that in a nutshell. So that's my recording. OK, thank you. Any other questions on the two hackathon efforts? I think they were very productive. I'm, I thank everybody that put in all the time to do them. So, All right, so we were going to move to um, uh, agenda item eight in our very bruised agenda. Do we have slides for that? Did we do slides for that? Which ones are they? So you're going to leave this here. Yeah, you need to. Huh? You need to. OK. All right. Um, so I think over the past couple of days after the hackathon, we we've gotten together a bunch of us and talked about you know, kind of the, the what, what's the core of the working group. Like, what, what are the core work items that that we need to worry about in this working group? And if you had to add one or label each one of those things with one word, it would be essentially collection, evaluation, and messaging. Um, I think we have people who are interested in each of these areas, which is a positive, which means that we should be able to parallelize most of that work. Um, and there is going to be some overlap, I think, like depending on who you talk to, you might hear the word orchestration and messaging go together. Uh, you might hear the word orchestration and collection go together and orchestration and evaluation go together. Uh, so there will have to be a little coordination between these things, but um, in general, uh, we have some some language that we might start looking at as a working group for each one of these items. Um, and that's pretty much as far as I think we've gotten. So we can look at this language now. I don't go next. Collection is uh, a set of bullet points. Danny and uh, Bill and Hank, I think, were the primary people putting this together. Is that right? Yes, Bill. But you talked about it, didn't you, yesterday? <laughs> I provided a sentence. OK, thank you. But you contributed. All right. No, the sentence was about notes. Say again? The sentence was about notes. Don't show me. Just show me the sentence. 
I don't know what sentence that was. Uh, you sent it, you said thank you. It's in your box. You want to call the deadline. It was before 9 a.m. today. You can't share. It was before. So, revisiting this. The original agenda had this charter discussion with all of these bullets in it. The request at the beginning of the week was we needed to identify what the next steps were for us. Uh, I think the phrase at the time I was using was three to five documents. My understanding, and I wasn't available for yesterday's meeting, was that we've come up with three categories. We have a list of what those things are. Uh, I think the next step is, the intention is that we were going to uh, rewrite our charter, not rewrite our charter, but refine our charter based on these three steps. And those are your three steps. Um, so, uh, I, I don't know, <laughs> given the, um, So, do you want to do the one sentences or do you want, I, I'm not sure how easy it is to actually edit this level of charter change on, in, a, in a group setting like this. I mean, do we, I'd, I'd like to give, what I would like is for people that the key proponents of each of these areas that are going to help us write this text, if they could describe shortly at the microphone what each of these are, would that work? Yes. And then, based on that, we're going to go off and work on refining the charter text on the mailing list. So, a uh, collection you would propose, Hank? So, Hank, why don't you share the sentence that you mailed to us at some point in time? I can say a few words. You can say a few words. Yeah. few. So, it's lesson learned, as Dave would call them. And it's about, um, we collected stuff and our yang focused work and we found that getting filter expression to the collector of course seems to be important otherwise you will always get everything if and that's the second lesson learned you know what target endpoint to query in which yang modules are available so we have to orchestrate collection with two sets of imperative guidance the first is like the VDD, how to get the information. This would be the filter expressions. And then where to target these subscription at, which sounds kind of simple because both are very collection rated, but doing that manual will never scale at all. First of all, due to 800 plus ITF plus, I know, about 2000 modules in general outside there and a lot of endpoints. So um, taking into account that Komi and Komi PubSub might be a thing soon, uh, we will most certainly need to create a very lightweight way to uh, orchestrate this, as less overhead as possible. So can you, uh, you said you had one sentence. I would like you to tell us what that one sentence is. Okay. <sighs> Just read the work group will try to find a way to provide two types of imperative guidance to the correct second collectors. First, which target endpoints to collect from, and second, what to collect from this target endpoints. When classified, a set of instructions such as VDD or Yang filter expressions can be brokered to appropriate collectors. Alas, detecting classifying beforehand might require orchestrating functions that go beyond the set of capabilities a second collector can provide. Manually configuration of targets and corresponding collection profiles will not scale and does not seem to be a viable option in the second space. Wow, you misled me. You said one sentence. <laughs> Okay, ne never mind. Yeah. So, so, Hank, just to clarify. Go ahead, Danny. Yeah, Hank, so it just covers beyond just Yang data models, right? As one of the examples is VDD, yes. Uh, this is a general collection problem. Yeah, I just want to make it clear it wasn't just Yang and that it was other data models as well. Yes. That's all. Okay, cool. And sorry, I just uh, took the other two as examples. No, that, that's fine. I was just, I lost the, track of the sentence. Yeah, I wanted. Wanted. that's right. <laughs>
That's why I didn't want to read it. <laughs> so, so on the collection front, Dave Waltermeyer, on the collection front, um, based on what we learned from the hackathon, um, we have we already now have two methods of collection that we've been that we've been working with. Um, we've got the you know the swimmer based you know, software inventory collection. Um, we have arguably a much more robust um, Yang, you know, based uh, collection mechanism, you know, with um, with Yang push, netconf, restconf. Um, would it make sense for us to look at how we can orchestrate across, you know, multiple collection methods? Because it seems like one of the things that is a, a reality of the current marketplace is that there's a lots of lots of different kinds of devices that we're working with um, and that there are different management approaches that we can use with different kinds of devices different collection approaches um, and that we need to figure out some way to be able to orchestrate you know across across those yes one lightweight orchestration mechanism for to, to bind them all Yes. Yeah. Something. Otherwise, like that. it would be not feasible anymore. Is that part of what you're thinking about yes. doing? Because I didn't hear that in, in what you what you just said. Okay, I should have made it more clear. Yeah. But that's maybe the case. Right. Okay. Thank you. And lightweight is a very important term here. Yes. So. So that, uh, yeah. It, we, we have lots of different ways of collecting, right? Like we might prefer to collect on a Windows environment using WMI. We might prefer to collect from network devices using NetConf, WestConf, Yang, you know, that kind of thing. We might prefer oval system characteristics generation for something else. Or for this technology over here that has a particular way of doing it, we might prefer that. I think we look at a couple of these different areas perhaps uh, like individually, and then try to extrapolate from those and how we ge make it generic. Does that make sense? No, it makes sense in my mind, but anyway. Cool, so uh, that was collection, right? How about uh, evaluation? Yeah. Steven, thank you. Lost our screen again. Yeah. There's a sentence. <laughs> we have it up there. Okay, so Steven Banghart, NIST. Um, so these three things that we're talking about really kind of came from the hackathon effort in the first place. Um, the original goal of, of kind of the idea of the hackathon was to identify the actual specifications that we could write to fill in these gaps. Um, of course, I do not have a sentence either. I apologize. Um, and I'm not going to read it aloud on the microphone. Um, I will learn lessons from, from my predecessor. Um, <laughs> So one of the things that we identified as a gap in the hackathon, and Dave alluded to this when he talked about the results of the hackathon, is um, a way of talking about evaluation in a way that is expressive, but not horribly difficult to write and read. So for the hackathon, what we were using to fill in this gap kind of as a temporary solution was oval definitions. Um, and for several reasons, we weren't quite happy with the way that oval definitions worked in, in the hackathon scenario. And so we kind of identified this evaluation piece as a missing gap, a place where we could actually write a specification, um, a standard that could fill in that gap and actually work in the way that is most, uh, most beneficial to this use case. Um, and you'll have to uh, forgive me for my voice. It's a little bit rough this morning. But um, so this is the second thing that we identified as our work items that could potentially be added to or you know, as part of the refining process for the charter update. We are thinking as a working group that we could write a standard that describes a language um, that allows us to describe the evaluation process kind of in the way that oval definitions do. Something that allows us to actually write out um, a kind of query almost, a way of saying, uh, software version greater than this and this or this and construct a statement that we can, for example, store on a Rolly server and be able to pass around different pieces of this system. So this work item kind of represents putting together that language that would allow us to describe that, 
that evaluation in a way that's expressive, machine readable, um, but that's not horrible to read and write because uh, we, we had some problems with that with, with, with Oval. I'm popular. I don't know if that's good or bad. Uh, Shweta Sisko, uh, would this also cover um, how we get the, the known good values to evaluate against, or is that in, in the messaging? Uh, I think that would be a different part of this. Uh, this is just writing the, this is the, uh, this would be a standard for the language that allows you to kind of uh, evaluate against those values, um, but not a way of determining those values in the first place. Okay. Um, but, if I understood your question correctly. Right. But, but is there something in the charter in the collection evaluation messaging where we have a specification to say how to get the known good values for an operational network where which can then be evaluated against what is collected? So you mean like determine what the non-vulnerable versions of software are or something or, like that or? Yes, or, or, or the hash of the, the process that is running um, that I want to run on the, on the system and then compare against once I collect it. So mi minimally, that would not, yeah, if Hank has an answer, go ahead. Uh, the um, code split spec for uh, split, sorry, draft of the S, uh, S second work group, it, it addresses exactly that thing. We, we use the SWIT documents as reference integrity manage, measurement manifests for every software package of an endpoint. You can request the complete manifest and have reference values for every applied software and for IMA, you can measure before start, and then it would address exactly what you just said. It would be a, a golden or uh, well-known measurements. And, and that could be pulled from anywhere else in the network, which is a point the, of truth. The idea is, is that these are uh, vendor supplied, and if they are not vendor supplied, you can create evidence tags with golden reference templates. You have to create yourself inside, inside the enterprise, which is a huge complicated process, but it would also be possible to do that. Okay, thank you. Dave Waltermeyer. Uh, another way of looking at this is, um, so, so in my organization, NIST, we run something called the National Vulnerability Database. And um, part of what the NVD does is we, um, for a given vulnerability, uh, we analyze it. We, we try to map that to the vulnerable product versions that are impacted by that, that, that vulnerability. And so as part of writing those kinds of mapping expressions, we have to be able to say things like, you know, um, a piece of a system will be vulnerable if, um, if software XYZ, a version um, equal to or less than, you know, version, you know, 1.2 um, is, is present on the device and a specific operating system is also running on that device, as an example, because there's an interaction between the application and the operating system. Um, we need the ability to describe those kinds of statements in a standardized way. Um, this kind of language would potentially allow us to, um, to do that, um, to allow an, an, an enterprise to um, download that information, which I think we're calling vulnerability detection data in the vulnerability assessment scenario, and then use that to um, compare with um, collected software inventory information that was done using the collection and messaging capabilities that we're talking about today uh, to actually support a more full assessment approach. So that's, that's one way that we kind of envision this working. Um, the last sentence in this, this text up here is also important because I think what this is trying to say is that the intent here is not to find one, one collection method to rule them all, but what we would like to try to do is to find a, a way to do an evaluation approach that can begin to unify various, various, um, uh, various collected data from across, across different approaches. So maybe the point in which we can start to bring you know, these disparate views of devices together is, is through this evaluation language. Right, and I did leave out that last sentence. One of the important pieces of this is that it is kind of agnostic to the mechanism that collected that data in the first place. So we don't have to define one of these for every single mechanism. Okay. Yeah, uh, Dan Romashkano. So, so, so maybe it's um, a kind of uh, confusion uh, on my side because of the way uh, uh, the text is uh, written. But I, I have a slight concern about uh, going into uh, 
um, in, into um, the field of uh, former languages and uh, uh, evaluation and uh, uh, kind of concerned about uh, the complexity of uh, the work that is uh, being uh, uh, done here and um, especially uh, will be extensible enough to be applicable to the full range of collective posture attributes um, uh, kind of um, um, uh, rings a bell to me and, and all kind of uh, triggers a warning signal and I, uh, I, I would suggest that we are very very specific about uh, what uh, will be included and try to uh, restrict ourselves because uh, otherwise we can uh, uh, actually uh, both get into into a field where uh, there is a huge range of contributions and probably a lot of prior art on the other hand we may not have uh, the full uh, knowledge or expertise to uh, to expand no that's right um and you know you, you raise a good point that formal language design is always going to be difficult um and have lots of complications to it as specific as possible right right yeah i was trying to try and keep this uh keep the description of this as specific as possible what you mean yeah uh, Frank Xia, uh, uh, from from your from the text written here, I really cannot see what is uh, 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 um, what work, what standard of work we can do for the inter interoperability, because they are more like some uh, system, you know, in, uh, in system design something. You need to design some mechanism to do the evaluation, maybe some policy, some rule. Uh, that that's that's my my, my maybe may, may be wrong, but my, my 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 initial feeling. And the second question is that I'm wondering, or uh, I want to know, what do you really uh, want to use this evaluation solution to cover cover which scope? Uh, just to cover the current uh, second work, for example, we we, we already uh, collected the uh, the the software uh, information and we do the evaluation on our current work, or you want to do a more general evaluation work for. Maybe for net uh, future for the network uh, information collection and then to the evaluation. So, what is the scope of this work? So, um, I'll answer the the first question first. Um, which, so, there's languages out there that kind of approach this similar issue. So, I mean, if you're familiar with Oval, for example, um, Oval is already kind of this evaluation language, right? Um, and so, that's the kind of standardization effort that I think. I'm referring to is um, uh, something like that 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 it, that more closely addresses the things that we actually want to do here in SACM, um, which I think is a good tangent into your second question. That I think SACM needs to identify things that will work for SACM if it works for other things through extensibility or something else. Um, then obviously that is very very good. Yes, um, I think I think SACM um, needs to identify something that will work for SACM, um, but we definitely have an eye on, and that's kind of this last sentence here, right? Is the extensibility, um, the ability to uh, use this to address data, um, regardless of where that data kind of came from. So this is a SACM work item. If it ends up usable elsewhere. Then that's something that we're not going to turn down as part of this process. Okay, I see. Yeah, thank you. Personally, in my opinion. Hi, this is Hank. And to uh, check up on uh, Dan's comment of uh, "Oh my God, red flag." Uh, this can be very, very complicated. There is yes. already a draft in existence in the IETF that it attempts this to simplify the solution. It is the uh, uh, I2NSF draft for uh, uh, inf capability information model. They they introduce um, the an, an ECA model, an event uh, condition action policy rule that can be cascaded. And there's even a capability algebra for that that can deduct or add to the rules set dynamically in a hierarchy. So this is a very simple and powerful tool. It is uh, John Stresno is unfortunately not on site, who is a really excellent expert on this domain uh, had a hand in this. So uh, I would uh, give him the benefit of doubt that it is quite feasible <laughs> because he does scalable distribution systems for like 20 years. And so um, I would have a look at that and not reinvent the wheel if this is appropriate. Right, yeah, so if it's appropriate, then it's it's something that, that would, would be good. Um, I think that 
I would be curious to see how that fits into kind of the gap identified by the hackathon, where we have some statement stored on a Roli server that we're dynamically discovering and pulling down a standalone statement with no other, with nothing else, and then evaluating that against a collected data store, an arbitrary collected data store. Um, and I'm not sure if that if that fills that gap. Um, maybe we should have a direct uh, a second interim, including John, uh, uh, introducing him to our problem. And maybe he is willing, if he has the time, to give us a simple example how this can be solved. Exploring existing work is an important part of this work item. Uh, yeah, uh, Jan Romashkano again. So uh, I very much agree. It's, it's a good idea to invite uh, the author and, and uh, have uh, a session uh, uh, with uh, him or them. Uh, just my point to uh, emphasize my point. I, I understand what you are trying to, to do here, and I believe that's valuable, and uh, it's been identified as a gap, and, and we need kind of an uh, uh, interface that uh, exposes the results and uh, of the evaluation uh, externally. Uh, I believe that we need to be careful to make a delimitation between the interface that describes so that the results can be uh, 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 provided and, and read, read in, uh, in a consistent manner, and, and the way uh, to do it because the, the way to do it is, is actually uh, quite a complex area. And again, we may not have uh, all the needed complex, uh, all the needed expertise uh, in this room. So if I understand your comment correctly, are you recommending that we produce multiple standardized efforts and perhaps one of those is a standardized no, result? Or? No, no, no. Uh, um, uh, actually, what I'm trying to say, and it may not come very clear, I believe that we need to, to, to start with uh, the external, the exposed uh, layer, uh, and then see what we need to do uh, okay. for for uh, the other layers behind, uh, below. Okay. Sheila Frankel missed. I just wanted to reinforce what other people said. I mean, defining a language, deciding how to represent it and maintaining that, and writing an interpreter is, is a huge effort. So, you know, taking a language that exists and has a, a compiler or interpreter and extending it, I think, is much more manageable than starting from scratch. Um, so, agreed. One of the things that we actually talked about um, as a potential direction that this could go was actually looking at Oval and seeing if there's something that we could improve on in Oval, um, it, it work on top of an existing language and see where we can go with it. Um, I think perhaps there could be some, some if, if, the, if this is a serious concern of the working group, we could do some small edits to this text to make it more clear that what we're doing is identifying something that can fill this gap. And if that means that we need to write something new, if that means we need to update something, so be it. But um, I think as one of the gaps that was identified in the SACM hackathon, it makes it clear that this is something that, that needs to get done, um, regardless of how it gets done. So um, I think we could maybe bash the text a little bit, but this, this idea of filling in this gap with an actual standard um, is, is pretty important for this group to approach, um, in, my, in my opinion. Um, and it, so there's going to be some difficulties and some challenges, and we could probably edit this to better reflect what direction the working group wants to go in. But I just think it's important that we get it done. I, I don't think we need to bash the text now, but I do think it's very important that we are very clear that we're not going to reinvent. We're going to extend something or fill a gap, but we're not going to start from scratch. Well, unless we need to, right? I would be, I just can't imagine that we would need to. So uh, I, I think you're going to get serious pushback. Actually, the serious pushback is moving to the mic as I speak. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen Moriarty, AD. Um, you really have to do a lot of proving that we would need something new as opposed to working with yang and all of the other tools we have and and oval was contributed and there's a large number of implementations of that and of course yes i know it's broken but fixing that is is fine for you know i know you guys have plans and thoughts about that so something new i i don't know that's it it it's not something i'd like to see happen um you'd really have to prove that it's necessary okay All right, so messaging.
center, right? <laughs> Nancy Kim Winslet from Cisco. Uh, so the title is messaging, but it's really about defining what I put up here as the control plane functionality, as well as the transfer protocols that are needed to actually convey the information that SACM is interested in. And I'm leaving that abstract because we're talking about posture collection as well as posture evaluation, as well as the very control and configuration functions that are needed to orchestrate um, the flow of information in a secure function, because after all, we are security. So um, from that perspective, um, I think we've already done sufficient work and buy-in to know that we need that control plane function. And so putting it in terms of, uh, I think it's already been articulated in the requirements, but I'm open in to hearing other feedback. So given that we have the role and the functionality already expressed in the requirements, what I thought we would do is provide a document that shows the example for such an instance that could help us with that brokering, with that orchestration, as well as with the discovery. So as you've already heard, okay, I'm not that short. It's slowly falling. Um, uh, so as you've heard in the collection, right, we're gonna have many different methods in which we do the collection. And so by methods, to me, that translates to potentially different data models and different transfer functions. So how we discover that, right? And how we articulate the expressions for the actual assessment through the evaluation, um, I'll say rules for now. Um, all needs to be or orchestrated in some fashion, as well as having the different means from, and I'll say timeliness for now, so don't bash the terminology of, um, publish, subscribe, and query. This is really falling. Um, uh, so from a also, yeah, it's not working. From a data plane um, functionality, XMPP allows us to show the example of how we could do both the orchestration through the control plane, as well as a transfer, a unifying transfer mechanism by which we could do both the directed queries as well as the published subscribe. And that was one of the exercises that we were trying to prove in the hackathon. And I think we were successfully able to prove that point through using the Yang um, as one such example and putting that through the orchestration, that orchestration being through XMPP. And we've got a draft for how that applies in MILE, the XMPP grid, which we could do here as well for SACM. Okay, let the comments and feedback flow. Shweta, um, is this going to be the charter text? As in, are we going to call out a specific example of XMPP in the charter text? Uh, would that, yes. Would that limit uh, other possibilities of protocols that we might want to use? Well, so, if you're familiar with XMPP, you can allow different protocols in there and different data models. Um, if I want to use existing network topology discovery and the network devices become the point of evaluation, would, would, would that work with XMPP? Yes. So what we showed in the hackathon was, and, and part of the reason, so as Hank showed all the different requirements that we were trying to meet, right, out of the requirements draft, beyond the, the, um, the separation of data, right, we tried to show both the push model and the pull model, if you will. So with the Cisco switch, we were using the asynchronous publish model, where in that switch, we were doing updates of the network topology. That was one example. The other example was using the Huawei switch, which I think we were polling or querying. No, I can't remember. But it was more static, more of a query. 
No, it was still published. Okay. But one was more dynamic than the other is my point. Right. Okay. Thanks. So it was using the Yang push. Sorry. Yeah. This is um, I'm Karthik. Um, I had the same question actually. Is it so basically um, the there are typically orchestration um, software. Yes. I think you, you mentioned the same thing. There's there's basically you had you had something already running and you wanted to just integrate this functionality into correctly something that's already running. Right. right. Um, so as part of the messaging, are you defining just the, the model and the message formats or is it basically transport? Is it, it, it so my intent with the XMPP is just show how you apply the XMPP protocol to to apply and meet the SACM requirements. And so while we could use Yang, as you've heard in the collection, Yang is just one instance. We're going to have other methods. And so I'm thinking of SACM as that another level of orchestration for the different sure. collection and evaluation methods. Sure. Right. Thanks. Uh, hi, Nancy. Uh, uh, just a uh, clarification. Uh, yeah. You mentioned uh, the data plan and uh, the control plan for the yes. SMTP, but uh, 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 if we if we talk uh, if we go back to the uh, the first one the collection, uh, I think uh, the collection part uh, already include the uh, data plan protocol. For example, we have NetConf, right? We have NetConf some pub, and we you use that channel to get the message. And we have second pro protocol. We have the Maya protocol. So. Uh, so I just want to make sure that uh, I, I personally think that XMPP is very useful in the control plan, but I don't think that it will it need to uh, to replace the other data plan protocol. And I'm not expecting us to have one transfer protocol. Yes, yes. I expect us to have several. I'm just suggesting here, from an orchestration standpoint, XMPP can offer even in the data plane, right? Okay, a common another, transfer. Another way of data. Another, plan. yes. And uh, and the overall control plane. Maybe. From a control plane, I think XMPP would be an overarching, right? Yeah, and others are free to present others as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. But yeah. we need something to help with the orchestration. Uh, uh, to, uh, uh, still, uh, in, in, in second work, I, I, I'm still not clear what uh, we can achieve. Because currently we just do, we 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 we, we do not deal with the network part currently. Well, we, the, yeah. that's not quite true, right? Because we don't have the explicit documents to show you that. Yes. But part of the hackathon exercise that we did was to show how we could use the network infrastructure yes. to provide the attributes. Yes. yes. And so uh, one of the drafts that Hank submitted, I think, Today. was the extension <laughs> uh, in time. <laughs> we don't expect review yet to, for you to have reviewed it yet. But um, in the information model, we have put um, in the draft the applicability and how the Yang applies. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and we expect it to be yes, used. Yes, I like, yeah, I like this way. Yeah. I think uh, uh, if. I think network is, is, is very, very important part for the end-to-end -end network. So if we miss that part, I don't think the... Listen, I'm completely which, with you, which is why we yeah, did yeah, the yeah. hackathon, so and, and we're now going to put it into yeah. a formal draft. Yeah, so, so we'd we love the collaboration. Continue. Absolutely. Yeah. Hi, this is Hank again. I just wanted to point out that it is a, the idea, solutions are not uh, uh, competitive, but they, they are chained. So the young pub sub is one-to-one. -one. And the action people is end to end, end to end, whatever. And so, so they they are not they are not uh, competitors. We change all those. Right. And we, we made they made we put them in the right place and made use of them in the best way. So. Um, I was gonna say some Dave Waltermeyer. I was gonna say something very similar, like. An example of where we could use XMPP is to transmit a reference to a Rolly repository resource, uh, which can then be downloaded using an HTTP request, as Correct. an example. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I should have said, OK, what Dave said, what Hank said, right? More explicitly, we were using the Yang pub, right, um, to have the switches publish into the XMPP that's orchestrating it for SACM. Yeah, that's from, what he means by chaining. 
from uh, Jabber Jessica asks, would part of messaging of the messaging effort include defining data model requirements for the message messaging data plane? Okay, that's the messaging people. But uh, yes. So part of the reason why we spent all of this time and hopefully we've passed the ISG with the requirements draft. No. Okay. I I, I thought we had re any anyway different topic. Um, so for the messaging, so I my expectation, and this is Nancy speaking as an individual, not just for this, is that for the documents that we put together, we show the applicability and how it meets the specific requirements that we've worked so hard in the requirements draft. Also, this is Hank again. Hi, Jess. Um, we, uh, the, the draft I submitted today includes a very early experimental data model that might be a answer of multiple answers to your question. Man, everybody got a long queue. I'm done. All right, thank you. So, so based on these three areas, we expect to refine the charter, um, and we will do that on the mailing list. One, one last comment, Shweta. Um, I think uh, Hank mentioned that there's some work happening for tying these pieces together for collecting, evaluating against something that should be collected from somewhere else uh, in I2NSF. But I, I think uh, in the charter text, at least we need to see how that will fit into this whole system. So I don't see any charter text right now that points to how to collect the information, um, the, the known good values that uh, we discussed uh, a while ago. That part is not reflected in the text right now. Um, we could probably, I can bring it up on the mailer and we could. Yeah, I'd, I'd like you to bring it up on the mailing list. Uh, we don't actually have any charter text right now. What we have is the three areas that, okay, that we've thanks. identified. So we have a little bit, we've got more work to do there. Uh, but the other thing I would, would also strongly encourage, I mean, part of the whole, this whole exercise was to, Hank? So p part of, part of the, Part of this exercise was to try and to get us to narrow our scope and make some uh, incremental steps. And so what I don't want it to see us do is to take the scope and expand it all the way back out again. Uh, I, I'd like to see us have a narrower scope, move forward, and then you know do the next steps. All right? That's just what I would like to see. You guys get to decide, I guess, ultimately. But um, all right, so next. So what do we? So Swimmer was next. Charles. Yo. Charles. Okay, so I forgot. So I don't. I should be able to. So Charles, do you know how to start them? Uh, I I was thinking. Do, can you guys present? I've only got three slides. It seems. Uh, really complicated here. Okay. So, so you didn't request to be a remote presenter? I did request to be a remote presenter. I, I can I can try to figure out the interface here. Oh okay no never mind. We'll we'll get it. Let me uh, find your slides here. We can race. I can see if I can do it. Do I have it up? It's right there. Right? Yeah, I know. I, I did everybody watching. <laughs> yeah. All right. Go on, Carl. All right. Uh, so this is just a quick update on the status of Swimma. Next slide, please. So a uh, draft was sent out on June 28th. Uh, it addressed all the known issues. This was a combination of, of issues uh, received during a normative requirements review and also uh, from Andrea Stefan, who, as you saw, implemented this as part of Strong Swan. Uh, next slide. 
very short overview of of the slides or of the of the changes. First, I finally fixed the title to what it was intended to be. It's now Swimma PATNC as opposed to SWID PATNC. Um, the rest were a few optimizations. Um, instead of having to send unknown as a string, if you don't know uh, the location, it's just an empty field. Uh, provide some guidance on uh, a couple of the edge cases. Uh, if you need to report record that no longer is available, such as if it was deleted and you no longer have the deletion record. Um, Andreas requested that we reorder fields. I had changed things so that uh, uh, all the constant length fields uh, preceded all the variable length fields. Um, apparently this was not an innovation that was very useful. So uh, we switched to the more standard length value length value format um, and then uh, alter the software identifier algorithm for for SWID tags so that when the SWID tag is just identified by its software identifier um, it's it doesn't start with a random number which is its length it starts with some actual descriptive information that's more indicative of the tag and and made a few other minor uh, typo fixes and things like that. So that's pretty much the extent of the edits. Uh, you can go online and see the new draft. Uh, next slide. Uh, so far, I have not received any comments. Uh, didn't hear any uh, specific uh, changes, technical changes uh, with regard to the, the SWIMA draft out of the hackathon. That was sort of a thing that we were waiting for in terms of, uh, of, of maybe seeking working group last call. So uh, that's, uh, so that's where we are. Um, are there any questions, concerns, comments, or whatnot on the state of SWIMA at this point? Uh, Stephen Banghart, NIST. Um, one of the things we did in the hackathon was to test SWIMA and see if there were any gaps or things that did not work or needed work in SWIMA. Um, and we really didn't find any. SWIMA worked quite well for what we needed. Um, so just wanted to put in my support for, for moving this draft forward. Thank you, Stephen. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Charles. Oh, wait. Uh, Dave Woltermeyer, is the plan to move this to working group last call? I'm sorry, I asked him a question just as you started speaking. I didn't. I was just hear asking you. a question to the chairs. Um, is the plan to move this forward to working group last call? Um, I've <laughs> reviewed the draft and it seems in pretty good shape. How many people here have read this draft? Excuse me? Oh, one. OK. Um, is there any? Yeah, you will read it. OK, excellent. Uh, Nancy will read it. <laughs> the one. Jess said that she would read it on Jabber. Or she has read she it. She has read it, OK. Thanks. Um, are you ready? All right, I guess we'll, is there anybody that does not think we should move this document to working group last call? All right. Terminology, Hank. Hi, this is Hank again. I'm giving a short overview of the state of the terminology draft with a lot of ah, with a lot of help of co-authors. Thank you. Um, so next slide. Uh, as always, we do housekeeping. Um, we are entangled with the I2NSF terminology draft. And so as this, uh, this updated, we had to, uh, well, uh, hand and egg problem, but uh, we resolved a lot of uh, uh, interdependent uh, definitions and are now m way more consistent. And 
why this takes a little bit time. It is actually a super nice thing to have it in alignment. We also increased alignment with, uh, or improved alignment with 4949. Unfortunately, 4949 has a completely different definition for subject. And we wordsmithed a workaround for that. It reads like, oh my God, what are you doing there? And um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe uh, not everybody is really fond of doing wordsmithing, but in this case, the subject and in the context of SACUM, we have to really make clear that people understand what we try to convey here. It's an information element in SACUM, and it is, of course, a, a category of uh, other specific terms in the 4949, including objects and, unfortunately, also our semantics of an information element. Um, moving on, um, target endpoint profile was improved. Uh, we uh, referenced that from uh, 4949, uh, also target endpoint. Basically, 4949 is only referencing uh, common criteria here, so it's indirect common criteria reference. And um, yeah, well, uh, again, remediation of subject was clumsy. Please help. Um, we have a um, redundant definition somehow, I guess, at the moment, because uh, two years ago we were talking about endpoint attributes. And now with the oval terminology coming in and more aligning with 4949, it's actually, I think, endpoint characteristics. Uh, it's also the term that was took up by Cheap Charter yesterday. Uh, they were talking about uh, object characteristics and object could be an endpoint in this case. So uh, maybe we drop the old lingo and go with characteristics from there because also attributes are something else. Yeah, that, I think maybe this is this could ever raise this as an issue on the on the GitHub, and I think it's pretty straightforward. But I wanted to uh, highlight it, so uh, we could be uh, even incorporating Teep. Teep is uh, a lot, has a lot of interest in in security and talking to the right thing and evaluating it. So second might be uh, one consumer or partner of that at some point. Also, a virtual component was introduced into the terminology. I had a talk with Benoit about this. Um, they dropped. Uh, they, coming from Entity MIP version 4 and going with hardware components, there's a Yang module for hardware components, but not for virtual components anymore. This is a problem. Uh, Benoit asked the second workgroup if we are going with virtual component. At some point, please do our Yang module also. <laughs> we are missing that hard. Hi, Kathleen. Kathleen Moriarty, Area Director. Um, TEEP is not yet a working group. Um, yeah, not I yet, do suspect, you know, I am trying to help them to become one, but um, I wouldn't gate the work of SACM on TEEP. Um, you can reference definitions that they put in later. Le um, coordination is good, but don't gate the work. Uh, this is absolutely correct. Uh, I just wanted to, to, to make a smooth path here. So if they become it, actually, the, the charter does not conflict with the other stuff. That's the only thing here. So uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's not a dependency. It's, it's just smoothing the way if it is a, becoming a reality. Does that answer you? Are you done with the housekeeping? Yes, I think so. Okay, so my other question to the working group would be, is there another document this could fit into? It'll be received a lot better in the IASG as part of another document. I don't know if that would be architecture, and it would get published later at the end of the working group. So if you have terms that change, then it would be represented there. Or if it would be in one of the initial documents, like the information model or something along those lines. And it could even be in as an appendix or as a um, terminology section. Uh, Either one is, is more normal than just a terminology document um, in terms of what I've been seeing over the last few years. I, I, I saw that one coming. <laughs> so uh, yes, I think uh, from a semantic point of view, uh, the architecture was the best play to do it because uh, the old architecture actually had a list of terms just iterated as itemized list and then said those are defined somewhere else. So this would literally be the place where we could put all of those. There is one concern that it would create a 100 pages plus document, which nobody would ever then read maybe. Also, it might include terms that exceed the applicability of secure automation and is about, yeah, well. So 
I wouldn't be worried about nobody ever reading it because people, um, nobody reads, uh, except for the people like me who have to, a uh, terminology document, right? You, um, you reference it. So when you need a specific definition and another document points to it, you'll go back to that specific definition and that's what you would read. It doesn't matter where it sits. Agreed. Okay. And, and the, the, the most references will be from the architecture. The second best document would be the information model. The architecture, unfortunately, is not standard but informational. I am not sure if this has to be the case. So. Um, I don't think there's any problem with the definitions being informational. Yeah, the definitions, but the architecture itself then is also always informational. I actually don't know. If it's customary to have the architecture as an information object, then it's yeah, okay. Yeah, gloss, uh, 4949 is informational, so, and everybody's adhering to it anyways. So, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, Stephen Banghart, yeah, I'd like to make the case for um, perhaps as an option uh, moving the, the big chunk of this terminology either to the terminology section or to the appendix of the architecture. Yeah. I suspect that um, most of these terms are, are used pretty much just in the architecture to help define the architecture um, and that they're not really, most. I feel like most of these terms are probably not used again a whole lot in the rest of the documents. Um, and yeah, that's what it just, yeah. Right, right. So, so perhaps Moving those either into the terminology or an appendix of the architecture will help us kind of uh, reduce that down and then use the terminology sections of the other SACM documents to either I to define there or reference out to the definitions that are shared. I would really much prefer the letter because if you spread definitions across documents, you get angry. At least I do when I have to always ref <coughs> it's easier to have them have one document open and then use this as your dictionary than have uh, to browse and, and meta link your well, I feel like it's probably even easier to have all the definitions in the document you're reading anyway. So you only have to have one document open always. You can not merge the architecture and the information model, I'm afraid, but yeah. Right. So uh, my only point was that, that architecture is probably a good place to merge the, the Okay, thank you. So Kathleen Moriarty, so my advice would be to um, wait on publishing the architecture document then until later in the process because yeah. it could change anyway. Yeah, but we have this in mind. So the ultimate goal will at point X with your approval, we will merge architecture and terminology appendix. Basically. Oh, you have my approval, but you okay, need then we will do this agreement. Okay. I was asking for the working group. Yeah, but okay, if you're fine with this, I think nobody really. Oh, I'm here to that... help get your work through and give you guidance as to what's successful. You guys make yeah. decisions. So. Okay, agreed, thank you. Uh, next slide. Sorry for this taking so long. Um, there are a lot of new issues raised, so we are actually having a discussion on uh, making it better, which is really great. So chime in on that. Uh, at the moment, we have momentum. Um, uh, we, we thought that we would drop a variation, the term in favor of assessment. Yesterday there was, again, something basically the opposite <laughs> opinion. So now we have a discussion ongoing of, of that in the, this, uh, sorry, in the issue tracker. Please, if you have an opinion and want something or want decision on this, uh, or if you see semantic uh, difference between those terms, write them up, put them into the issue tracker, and then we can include them if the work group agrees. Um, yeah. Uh, I want to maybe point out that we will not cover attestation in the second domain, as it is a crossover group uh, terminology problem. Um, so we created an individual draft about attestation terminology, where we pulled in a General Electric's arm, and they have another Intel guy that almost says said yes, I will also be there. Because Intel and ARM are the, both of the companies that provide TEs, and Global Electric's uh, Global Research is uh, the, the author is an expert in hardware root of trust. Uh, like 20 years, he basically invented that. So um, all these people are very familiar with attestation, and so yeah, I think that's uh, that's that's way too big to get into the uh, terminology draft of second. Next slide. Uh, yeah, the same thing might happen with events. Not decided yet. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Thank you, Hank.
Hank, I think you're up next. Oh, okay. Hi, this is Hank. <laughs> A short, even concise update on concise software identifiers. Um, it's moving well. Next slide. Um, we added our first extension point. There is a reason for that. Uh, there was strong demand on having parity between the original SWIT interoperable part and extensions to that. So we have a first extension point in the resource collection type. Um, I will come to this later. There are now also explicit structures for file hashes. And as I have learned uh, from uh, experts in the ISO space, uh, a file can have multiple hashes that express the same integrity statement because you use different algorithms to create the hashes. I found this astonishing, but this is the case. So we have to do this like a multi-value uh, um, member now. Um, there is also uh, an uh, explicit appendix that will address uh, a problem we just heard before, the reference integrity measurements. You can have them in single ones or in manifests. There are specific guidelines how to do this. Uh, I forgot to put uh, normative language into there. This will be remediated. <laughs> and uh, the SWIT text cannot express uh, their absolute um, path position in, in a current instantiation of an uh, endpoint. So this is a claim we could introduce into a concise with using uh, a standard COT, uh, the uh, concise web token, which allows uh, to add claims to st other standards with structure, uh, like CBOS structures. So these are now uh, explicit appendices to the, uh, to the code suite, um draft. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and we have a problem. Uh, the XSD that's provided by ISO does not conform with its own normative text language. And unfortunately, my assumption is that most people download the XSD and use it. Unfortunately, it is not the ISO standard. And now we have the problem, do we adhere with what is probably common in practice, like in production? Or do we adhere to the normative text and break interoperability what with is, is in, in production? And, and, and I think that at the moment, uh, because the ISO standard is canon, we will adhere to the text and break interoperability with the current ISO XSD. It cannot be avoided. I think we understand what they try to express in the XSD, but they did not manage to do it, unfortunately. Uh, it's about cardinality most of the time. Um, so this is a decision I, I cannot make myself. I will raise this as an explicit question on the list today. Um, I will give an example of uh, what how the problem looks like typically. And then, uh, yeah, um, no answer. I will also pro provide this in the mail. Also, Quitake Consentir Revenitur. If there is no answer, I assume a consensus. Um, what? <laughs> Actually, it's it's up to Adam and I to determine consensus. Okay, so then do do. What what I would like to see you but do. But you have to answer then. Pardon? But then you then you have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to answer. You all have to answer, and we get to determine the result yeah. based on your answers. Okay. Uh, and and this. Uh, this one, I, I don't want to take no answer as consensus. Yeah. So I, I think we need to have people to actually, to actually answer it. It's not a... It's a big deal. I, I'm not saying it's not a big deal. I, I'm saying it's not a big ask. Okay. So. It's, not, it's not a... We're not asking you to review a 200-page document here. Yeah. Uh, so I think I'd like you to post your, your summary, uh, and then we'll have a little discussion, and then uh, yeah. either Adam or I will construct a question for consensus. Okay. But you're right, we do need to decide because... Yeah. I don't know where to start, so... Yeah. Uh, next slide. So uh, we're still missing uh, a, our own glossary of uh, SWIT attribute definitions. Uh, these will not go into the terminology draft because they are basically an equivalent but free available version of the descriptions from ISO. So we will use our own words. We will not uh, use any uh, or freely available words that are included in the XSD. Uh, so we have to have, uh, provide the own context and description of uh, software identities here. That's still missing 
at all. There's nothing written yet. Um, yeah, the claim stuff is still missing, and we have to do a final posture polish, which is including the decision on which uh, lead to follow the text or the XST. Okay. Yeah, and that's basically it from my side. Uh, a couple of quick questions. How many people have read this draft? <laughs> you haven't read the most recent version. How many people have read a version of this document? Okay. Um, I guess that's it. We look forward to your... I will run away now. You will run away now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we'll be asking the question again about how many people have read it before we try to move this to working group last call. I'd really encourage people to start reading it. Um, this is Hank as a my comment from the mic. I, I know of a lot of people from, from the ISO and the uh, um, US, US government who read it. Yeah. But they're not in the room probably. So. I mean, we'll, we'll get more feedback on the list, but obviously. Um, and next time. Ah, Stephen, software. I feel blind without my, all my back channels. <laughs> uh, Stephen Banghart, NIST. I'm um, going to be doing two things up at the mic right now. Um, one is providing a brief update on the actual draft that uh, is here submitted um, to SACM, uh, the software descriptor extension for Rolly. Uh, and the second thing that I will be doing, the uh, chairs have asked me to give a brief overview of Rolly itself uh, to talk about just kind of the basic overview, why we have a Rolly extension here in SACM. Um, this is going to be similar to the presentation I gave in SACM um, in Seoul, um, but with a, f a few updates to, to kind of bring it up to speed with the current state of the Rolly core draft. Um, so Rolly is a MILE specification that I've been working on in the MILE working group. We've just recently pushed an update dash 08. Hopefully it is uh, more or less stable at this point. Uh, we're working on getting it ready to to move forward um, out of there. So uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to be talking about and trying to do it succinctly, although I have a pretty decent sized time block, um, what, what Rolly is and why we made Rolly, what Rolly is going to do here in SACM. Um, so we created, we started working on Rolly because of this issue that we actually have here in SACM as well, that Information comes from many different sources for, in many different formats and even in many different serializations. Um, and trying to keep track of all that stuff is often very difficult unless you already know beforehand what you want. So if you're trying to distribute this information with this massive permutation space of all these different factors, you have to negotiate beforehand or otherwise know what you're looking for to go and fetch it from, from what you're looking at. Um, and then there's often this problem, and not in all protocols, but in many protocols, the issue of retrieving historical information as well. Um, all these different formats are being pushed out potentially on some kind of publication system. If I'm a new subscriber, I have no way often of going back and retrieving all this old information. Uh, next slide. Um, this is just kind of an example of that, um, of what I was talking about with historical information uh, with a traditional pub sub model. Uh, not all protocols have this problem, but many do. When a new subscriber joins the system, uh, they have a hard time going back and finding out all the things that had been published previously. Next slide. I should be looking down here. Um, and again, in a kind of traditional system where you're going to go and ask a server for a piece of information, Given the number of different formats and serializations, you need to know beforehand what you're getting or else it won't make any sense to you. Uh, you have to know that you're going and getting a file that's in, it's, it's an oval in, in XML. And you have to know that before you get it, otherwise it's, it's meaningless bits to you. Next slide. Uh, Rolly hopefully can help address some of those things in the security automation space. So Rolly is all about categorization, characterization, and discovery. It's a way of putting information up in a server that can be characterized in a standardized way, uh, categorized in a standardized way. 
So as somebody who has no idea what I actually want specifically, I can come to the server and I can actually, through a discovery process, discover what the server has available, what formats it has available, what information types and categories it has available, and start to pull those down. And so it's really focused around this idea of information discovery and information, information dis distribution. Some of the other important goals that we wanted to really do when we put together Roly was reduce round trips for data retrieval by reducing the bring me a rock problem where uh, one person is just trying different things until they finally find what they want and there's a decently high number of round trips for a system like that and reducing it to the point where you have a discovery request and then you know exactly what you want and you get it, so hopefully reducing round trips. Uh, as well as in the security automation space, there's often particular authorization and authentication concerns in terms of who can access and who can see what information. Uh, and Roly hopes to address that by granular access controls down to the resource level. Um, and, and ultimately, this is a security automation system to help allow machines to talk to machines about security automation. It's kind of the end all, be all goal of this. So, next slide, please. Uh, so Roly is actually an extension on uh, Atom Publication and Atom Syndication. It is a profile of those. Um, Atom Syndication uh, is a syndication format in XML. It's not dissimilar to something like RSS, if you're familiar with that, as a syndication format. Uh, and as an extension of Atom Pub, Atom Publication and Atom Syndication, uh, Roly builds on top of those features and can take advantage of things like uh, existing Atom implementations. So Roly, uh, the uh, other part of the Roly solution is really about this extensibility and that speaks to the issue I was talking about before with the amount of variation in the formats. Um, we can't list them all, not reasonably, we can't list all the uh, serialization formats and you just know that as soon as you do someone's going to make up a new one and suddenly there's the you know the new Captain Proto and the new JSON and who knows what else that's hip and cool um, and suddenly you're left in the dust. So Roly is intended to be extensible so in the future you can just register new things in this space and be able to continue working. Next slide. Um, so this is the discovery round trip system that Roly tries to focus on, instead of doing a bring me a rock, Roly focuses on a discovery request that allows you to determine what categories and information is present. And then ideally your second request is a hit to that actual resource itself. Next slide. Um, same concept with, with using this system in a pub sub. Uh, next slide. Which, so uh, actually this is what was being talked about with passing Roly over XMPP, um, allows you to do something kind of like this roughly. Uh, next slide. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here unless the chairs would like me to in terms of the actual in-depth anatomy of Roly. No, okay. Um, so I'll instead give a brief overview. Um, there are service documents. These are the top level discovery mechanisms. Um, this is a structure from Adam Pub, and this allows you to discover what collections of information are available on the Roly feed. Um, this service documents at a known URL, so if you have no idea if a host even has a Roly server, there's a uh, slash dot well known registration that allows you to discover this and see what information is present on their Roly repository. Next slide. The next step down is a feed. Feeds are just collections of entries which are effectively just information. They provide a little bit of metadata about themselves and then a collection of entries. Uh, next slide. Um, next slide. The most, the final level of Roly is the entry. The entry actually contains a link to the content itself and this is really the most important part of the process. The entry contains all of the characterizing and categorizing information about the content. So it's all uh, metadata exposure, property exposure, um, this allows you to learn things about the content without having to download the content. You instead download this Roly entry, which is never very long. It uh, allows you to determine if you actually care about the content before you dedicate to downloading what is potentially a rather large file. Uh, next slide. Um, this speaks to our extension system, and this is actually relevant here in SACM. The Roly extension system allows you to write new documents, new standards, track documents in the IETF to register 
new properties, categories, and information types. And this allows you to standardize the way that we talk about different pieces of content. Um, so we currently have submitted a extension to SACM called the Software Descriptor Extension. And that normatively registers software descriptor information type. What that means is it allows Rolly repositories to, in a normalized way, say, I'm carrying a software descriptor, something like CoSWIT or SWIT. Um, so now if I'm parsing through a Rolly repository and I find this standardized scheme and value of software descriptor, I know that what in that Rolly entry is one of those things, um, which is, is very useful here in SACM. And it's actually something that we demoed using this extension in the hackathon. We held SWIDs in our Rolly repository and demoed using this extension to allow them to be in a standardized way exposed and talked about in Rolly. Uh, next slide. Oh, uh, right, this is exactly what I was Sorry. talking about. Sorry, yeah, so, I, was, I was off by a slide. No, 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 actually I accidentally hit the button and I think I moved, so. So, um, yeah, this is what I just talked about ultimately um, with SWID tags. Uh, next slide. I, I wasn't trying to rush you along. I just was was tapping on my laptop. No, it's okay. I don't, I don't want to dwell too much on this. Um, just wanted to give a, a briefer overview. Um, so as I said at the beginning of this presentation, we've just published the most recent version of, of Rolly, which only contained minor edits from the version prior. So if you've read version 07, version 08 is not particularly different. It's mostly editorial changes and small edits. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about the Rolly core draft, then that is in Mile, uh, Rolly draft um, 08. The um, software descriptor extension is currently a personal draft in SACM, I believe it's, yes. So the call for adoption went out for software descriptor, if I remember correctly. Um, the, I believe that the email went out to list for that. Um, and so just waiting for that adoption process to go through. Um, I might be wrong. I, I can't look. So oh, I you're on the yeah, you're on the presentation. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, regardless, um, I have prepared a short dash o two version of the software descriptor that contains just uh, really kind of basic updates to reflect the most recent core updates. There's nothing significant. So if you'd like to understand this extension, uh, you can go and read the software descriptor extension in SACM. It's a draft Banghart Rolly software descriptor, I think, something like that. Um, and we're working on that. So that is my overview of that. There's no other updates to Software Descriptor right now to talk about, so I have nothing to talk about there. Um, I believe that we're talking about the next, another extension next, I think, right? Yeah, so I'll pass over the mic to talk, let Bill talk about another Rolly extension that we're doing here in SACM. Okay. Uh, while that's going on, I'm Bill Munyon, and I'm going to uh, talk about a very similar uh, extension uh, to Rolly that uh, is uh, kind of located here in SACM for uh, configuration checklists. You're trying to find it, Bill, sorry. No worries. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Yeah, there's nothing like having everybody watch you do this. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. This is why I hate being the one driving. <laughs> All right. Where the hell is it? Oh, there it is. There we go. Yeah, so we have a uh, zero zero uh, document there that's a, that uh, folks can review, um, and that's what we'd like people to do because uh, there's still a, a fair amount of comments and things that we need to do. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so the the purpose behind this really. Um, and this actually kind of speaks to a couple of the comments I think from previously about uh, sort of the known good values uh, that can be uh, used in evaluation and stuff. So uh, a lot of enterprises, uh, again, kind of operate uh, against a control framework and 
it, within those control frameworks is a uh, kind of recommendation to um, have defined uh, standard configurations for all of their uh, machines in their environment, network devices, all that kind of good stuff. Um, we kind of uh, term those as a, a configuration checklist for those uh, standard configurations. Uh, what that checklist defines uh, is a set of recommendations uh, for those endpoints, and those recommendations uh, really define uh, the expression of uh, the desired posture of those endpoints uh, or those configuration items. Um, you know, things like uh, password length, um, you know, registry settings, things of that nature. Um, you know, the, those recommendations uh, also contain other uh, kind of descriptive information, uh, what the recommendation is, why it's there, uh, what's intended to secure, uh, expected state of those uh, collected posture attributes. Um, could be published by an organization. I can only speak personally from my, my own uh, organization of, of publishing those checklists in uh, numerous uh, serialization formats, uh, PDF, Word docs, Excel uh, spreadsheets, uh, also automation content, um, you know, kind of XML, um, using other standards, Oval, XCCDF, and things of that nature. Um, could be supported within the, uh, the applicable uh, Roly content elements. Um, and uh, adding other properties uh, to uh, kind of speaking towards maybe attribution uh, for those uh, who kind of develop those configuration checklists. Again, uh, could be developed by a consensus process or um, you know, numerous folks that, that uh, are given attribution and can be added in, uh, and fit into some of those Roly uh, property elements. So uh, again, this kind of describes a, a separate information type uh, for those configuration checklists. Can go to the next one. Uh, so things that we uh, want to do, we've got a lot of comments uh, from Steven so far. Uh, appreciate that, that we need to kind of incorporate into the into the draft. Um, there's a, a bunch of to-dos uh, really that we still need to uh, kind of get to and, uh, you know, finalize those, I think, before we can uh, ask to uh, officially incorporate it into the working group. So uh, please read, uh, please review, please comment. Uh, we'll take any sort of feedback that you want to give? Uh, just out of, uh, just for timing and planning, is it, would it be reasonable to have the next version, like, in time for the next virtual interim? I was w wondering when we might be make, trying to ask for it to be a working group. I, I definitely think so, yeah, okay. by the next virtual interim, sure. Okay. It's not that huge of a draft. <laughs> okay. Uh, Stephen Banghart, um, the uh, myself and the other Roly uh, authors have also been thinking about, uh, with Dave Waltemeyer, have been thinking about putting together a template that uh, would allow for a more standardized form of the Roly extension drafts themselves. Um, so we we may or may not have that ready for the next virtual interim, but once that template is ready, um, it shouldn't be too hard to to put the checklist draft into that into, into that template into format. That template. So. That wanted. sounds like a useful thing to have, actually. Okay. And I've got no problems like converting it to a template, if, you know, as a new numbered version, if if need be. It should be pretty. Easy. Dave Waltermeyer, I just wanted to add to that. Um, we would love to have your help with creating that template. Sure. Because um, I'm sure you've got some insights into what you think is working well, what's not. So we definitely want to hear those too. Sure thing. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so, is Charles still on? Yes, Charles is still there. Okay, hold on a sec. Uh, Charles, are you still there? Are you I awake? Am, I am no I am, less present. I am no less present than I was at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> are you any more present? <laughs> no comment. No comment. <laughs> uh, let's see. Where are we? Uh, I just cannot. Oh, there we go. I am in so need of coffee. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Charles. All right, so I'm between you guys and lunch, so this is actually going to be pretty quick. Just wanted to make you all aware uh, Trusted Network Communications Architecture 2.0 uh, is imminently out uh, for publication, uh, maybe a few weeks, but I uh, wanted to let people know that this was coming up. So uh, next slide, slide two. 
so why why are you interested? Um, so TNC, Trusted Network Communication, was the foundation of NIA. The two specification suites are compatible with each other uh, or, or interoperable with each other. And we've been using NIA uh, quite a bit in, in the SACM work. So uh, it's uh, SWIMA is, is an extension of some of the NIA specifications. So uh, basically, this this is sort of an indirect, but it, it does uh, it does potentially impact uh, activities of interest to us um, just because NIA and TNC share this link. Uh, so next slide. So it was, uh, we TNC uh, decided that they needed to do a revision of the specification. It was actually first published way back in 2005. It hasn't been updated for a long time uh, and it had fallen out of sync with current use and practice. So we wanted to to get that updated and also uh, just do a better job of sort of explaining uh, the utility uh, of TNC. Uh, the hope is that the way that this has been present uh, presented uh, will will get more people thinking about, hey, we can use TNC to solve some of the problems that we've got. Um, next slide. So uh, the TNC architecture itself is not a normative document in the sense that there is no, in fact, normative text within it. So with regard to that, yay, no, there's, there's no normative alterations that are going to cause incompatibilities between uh, the TNC and NIA specifications. Uh, what, what did change is how TNC was characterized primarily. Um, TNC, the original TNC was very comply to connect oriented about you know doing the evaluation prior to connection and that was that was it we wanted to uh, emphasize the role of TNC as a, a uh, ongoing uh, ability to to scan an endpoint uh, even after connection uh, there was also some conflation of roles in the original document validation and enforcement roles were were one and the same uh, and and there was a recognition that actually we should we should be breaking those apart. Um, we there was also a desire to add configuration management database uh, roles. So this uh, there's already an orchestration capability within TNC, and that that hasn't gone away. Uh, but in terms of sort of longer term storage of collected information, making that available for for subsequent use, uh, that that was a role that got added. Um, and then finally, we, we changed how uh, it was, the, the specification itself was described, the original version. And if you look at the NIA specification, the NIA specification follows this, uh, was very specification based. You know, this is, these are the use cases and here are the specifications that comprise NIA. Uh, the TNC 2.0 specification um, looks a little more at, okay, these are the capabilities, these are the sub elements and tries to emphasize that this is a composable set of, of things that you can use. It's not a, uh, you have to comply with every single one of these specifications, but in fact, you can decide what rules you need, what capabilities you need, and pick the pieces that you, uh, that are applicable to your specific scenario. So we try to make it uh, a little more uh, visibly flexible. Uh, the original TNC was this flexible, but it was sort of hard to tease that out of the specification as it was. So those are the main changes uh, in terms of the actual text and structure of what's presented. Um, if you go on to slide five, so this is the this is the TNC 1.1 uh, uh, diagram and you've, it's, it's the five column version. You've got uh, your access requester, that's your endpoint, policy enforcement point, and then this policy decision point, which is both the uh, collection, evaluation, and enforcement arm of, of TNC all rolled into one. And then metadata access point uh, is, is the orchestration capability. Uh, so that was, that was how TNC1 was presented. But if you go to the next slide, uh, we've broken out a number of things. You'll, you'll see on the far right side that now, in addition to the metadata access point, there's the CMDB, Configuration Management Database. Uh, which is a separate uh, sort of back-end capability for storage of information. You'll also see that the policy decision point has been split uh, into 
the policy decision point. That's that's still the enforcement. Uh, but then there's the uh, compliance evaluation point. That is collection and validation, but not necessarily uh, triggering an enforcement uh, action. Um, instead, uh, the CEP would be a feed to some other, to, to both the CMDB and also to the metadata access point and allow other tools to take whatever action or, or do whatever analytics are appropriate. So it's it focuses on collection and, and potentially evaluation, uh, but not the the enforcement action. And you can see also on the bottom, uh, what used to be the network access requester has been split into the posture transport, which would be the uh, transportation of, of the information, but without the enforcement uh, activity going through the network access enforcer. So it's basically a, a clearer segregation of roles um, and the addition of a few new roles uh, within the TNC architecture. Uh, with that, uh, moving on to slide seven, uh, the, the other sort of main conceptual idea is the breaking out of, of TNC into three main capabilities. There's the compliance capability, access control capability, and orchestration. Orchestration's the metadata access point, um, but also in, in many regards, the CMDB. Uh, the compliance capability, that's that compliance enforcement point, that's collection, uh, possibly validation, but not necessarily uh, going out and directly changing uh, network state, maybe leaving that to other tools that are, are hooked via the orchestration capability. And then, of course, the access control capability, that's that's our original policy uh, enforcement point. So all of these uh, are interconnected, um, but it, we, we really want to sort of emphasize that, hey, there's these three distinct capabilities and you can compose and and select the items that are appropriate to your use case. It moves away from the impression, not necessarily correct, but certainly there that if you're implementing TNC, you're implementing everything. And, and, and we wanted to emphasize that that was not the case. Uh, so slide eight. So just just a uh, emphasize, you know, the TNC architecture tries to emphasize TNC as a composable solution with lots of capabilities that you can pick and choose from and put together the solution that you need. Uh, I, I would argue that in, in this regard, it really aligns, it makes it more clear how TNC aligns with SACM, the, the versatility, architecture, flexibility, topology, flexibility, these are all much more clearly visible in the TNC 2.0 architecture than I think they were in the in the 1.0 and by extension in the in the NIA specification. So uh, bottom line is that this this is a fairly important update that TNC will be pushing out fairly soon. Um, but that despite the fact that we're revising this key specification, uh, it's not creating any incompatibilities with the NIA specifications and, and thus with what we're using in SACM. We haven't bifurcated anything, uh, but hopefully we will make the, the sort of capabilities that we're trying to make as a key statement within SACM, uh, the sort of flexible architecture more visible within the TNC architecture. Uh, so with that, uh, are there any questions about the TNC architecture or TNC activities in general? Any questions, anybody? Or does everyone want to get to lunch? Uh -huh. Sorry, Bob, I didn't hear you. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> You're sitting in the section that I told people they were un <laughs> unable to see. Okay, so it uh, doesn't appear there's any questions. Thanks, Charles. This is a good update. All right. Thank you. All right. So this brings us to the end of our agenda. Um, we have... 
uh, we we had talked at the last meeting about having a hackathon to help focus our deliverables. Uh, I think we've made some pretty good progress towards that. Um, I think what we uh, need to have is some mailing list discussion to to hammer out the charter, uh, the charter update, uh, and uh, I think we need to we need some more work to define what our work items are. Right, so. Um, we'll be working on that in advance of our next, we will have a, at least one virtual interim, maybe two. Uh, maybe that's all part of our work item planning. Does anybody have any thoughts or uh, thoughts are coming? <laughs> um, are you done or no? Yeah, I'm, yeah. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt. Kathleen Moriarty, AD. Um, so the charter update, we have to do that as soon as possible. The IESG has noticed that it has gone um, um, uh, beyond its expiration date. So um, unless you have real milestones tied to dates, we should leave that out in an updated charter. Um, there's always a trigger to close a working group, so we don't necessarily need a trigger like that in the charter. Right. Um, yeah, so I think either leaving it out or tying it, the only working group that has theirs tied to specific milestones is IPSECME, and they do evaluate their charter and update it annually and base it on adopted documents. So if you'd like to take that approach, um, no. I, I, I personally would rather not take that. I yeah. mean, obviously it's not my decision, but... Uh. It's, it's not a normal... So I think right. these are the only two working groups that have such a date in their right. charter. And that one was received better than this one, but not that great. Right. I mean, I, I would prefer to see, I mean, I, I would like to see the charter narrowed a bit. Um, but what I really want to see is that list of work items, the, 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 my three to five documents, which is going to turn into whatever we're going to end up doing. But I, I really want to see what our next steps are. Um, so I agree, and having it tied to priorities of the, the working group and um, what you really want to accomplish and get out of this work effort. Right, so to that end, can we rely on the, the folks who put together the collection, the evaluation, and the orchestration messaging work items that we discussed earlier today to continue working on those, refining those, you know, subpart them out if you have to um, over the next couple of weeks I mean you say soon like as soon as possible right Kathleen so like what does that mean does that mean a month from now or like we need to get it hammered out so tonight over beer or something August is usually tough I don't know how many people are affected in this room by um, or in this working group rather by August vacations probably a few I know I am at least but, but probably not well okay so you're not the whole month of like August September. like some is that what you're thinking? Like September? Like yeah, September is fine, I okay. think, with the August um, right. slowdown that we usually see. That gives you breathing room? So, so that's our, our, our deadline, but it, there's a part of me that thinks that it, this, this, is not, this is not a significant effort. It's the, the charter itself, I think defining the milestones and the de definition of the work items is, is, is a little bit harder, maybe. But I think we can update the charter and get the data out of it pretty quickly. Great. Yeah, the sooner the better. And and we could set September as the last, last possible date. OK. I'd say like a week or two into September as the last possible date. All right, date. so mid-September is uh, when our AD will get grumpy if we haven't done it. Very grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> Not just grumpy, but very grumpy. OK. Um, uh, d uh, so, is there? Do you have any closing remarks? Uh, yeah, closing remarks. I just want to say thank you for everybody who participated in the hackathon, and uh, you know that wasn't just this weekend. It was planning it and you know attending those weekly meetings that we had and everything. I think it went really well. Um, thank you for your work. Oh, I just spilled somebody's water. Okay, it's just water. Okay, so I also wanted to thank everyone as well. Um, it shows a lot of effort from the working group and it um, 
yeah, it's a really positive thing to do this work. So thanks for all the effort you guys put into it. All right, anything else? Well, with that, I give you an extra 20 minutes back in your day.